as a former Minister of Tourism, Culture and Creative Arts, whose tenor, Excellency John Dramani Mahama, started this project, I am worried that it's been backed out. Can you apprise us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, and this is um, one of those uh, iconic projects that certainly will transform um, Ghana as a destination. Um, actually, the president constituted uh, a team um, led by um, Dr. Kwame Yantichi, um, who has taken um, various steps um, towards that realization. Um, so that certainly is on top of our uh, agenda. Um, the challenge um, for us, uh, it's really with regards to um, concluding arrangements uh, for payment of rights, uh, etc., uh, and then finding the appropriate uh, joint venture partners such as uh, developers in Dubai, etc. And um, Dr. Kwame Nantaji, as you know, a seasoned entrepreneur, has done projects um, of that magnitude. Um, so we are comfortable in the trajectory uh, that we are in, and, and we expect um, to see um, um, some major developments um, this year um, as part of um, the, the, the plethora of um, private partnership that we'll do um, through the Obatampa project. Um, so uh, former minister, rest assured um, that this is um, of importance to us and the leadership for the delivery unit uh, has, been, um, um, has been agreed on, and, and it will be done. Thank you. I really hope that this project will come to fruition because we all know that Ghana will be the winner if we continue. Still on tourism, the UNWTO World Tourism Barometer has indicated that international tourism arrivals declined by 69%. And we all know that in Ghana, tourism is the fourth exchange, foreign exchange earner. We also know as a fact that tourism is public sector led, private sector driven. And so without the private sector, tourism is not going anywhere. I am therefore surprised that in the 2021 budget, I don't see the private sector anywhere in the budget, especially the pages that talk about tourism. I don't see any package that seeks to bring the tourism private practitioners out of the woods. You know that their businesses has decreased by 69%, yet there is nothing about them in terms of packages or anything that helps them to bring their businesses back. What do you say to that? Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think that the, the woes of the tourism industry are quite clear and, and you correctly do characterize it. Um, in our um, 2020 um, sort of rescue package, uh, we had a $2 billion um, guarantee facility uh, to support uh, various industries, especially in the hospitality. Um, area. In this budget, you realize that there's a tax deductibility um, for tourism, hospitality, and other um, companies um, of that sort. Uh, but I think what is also uh, going to be an intervention, as I mentioned earlier in the morning, is the establishment of our um, National Development Bank, which will be a warehouse bank, which can then funnel resources uh, into specific banks um, that um, allocate uh, resources to these areas that need a stimulus. Um, so the banking structure, um, uh, the financial structure, uh, we are strengthening it with the entry um, of the National Development Bank um, to be able to um, support um, areas such as that. So yes, there was a $2 billion guarantee for facility in 2020, and then this year also, uh, we have um, put in place uh, some tax reliefs uh, to be able to support them further. And thirdly, once the development bank is also operational, that gives access um, to more capital to support them. Uh, but as we, um, Mr. Chairman, as, as 
um, the AFCFTA is located in Ghana, I think it gives us a mandate um, for investment tourism opportunities to clear so that we become a regional hub. And that certainly will also help uh, in this regard. Now to the financial sector cleanup. Can you apprise us with how much was used to clean the bank and how much was needed to save them? Honourable Member, I think we have ruled that since we have decided... No, that one is not about whether he closed the bank legally or not legally. It's just about whether he could have been saved. So it's not the bank, not the portman. The quantum yes. of the yes. indebtedness yes, and please. very well. Not the hot one. I, I am conscious of being prejudicial. Like how much was used to clean the banks and how much did they need to survive? Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think so far, uh, um, you know, the, the processes of um, um, the whole uh, bank cleanup is really the purview of the Bank of Ghana. You know, so, so let's have a clarity on um, the asset um, quality reviews and all of those analysis that were done and their recommendation as to how to go forward to create a robust banking um, infrastructure. And as we can see, the results have been quite stellar because we have a much stronger banking infrastructure than we had in 2017 or 16. Um, so the decisions as to um, what the banks um, require um, for acquisition or cleanup um, is also, in a sense, directed um, by the Bank of Ghana as to whom they will accept as banks and you know how to save depositors' money, etc. So we spent north of 21 billion on uh, the banks, and I think the target for the asset management companies may be as high as eight and a half billion that we are we are looking we are looking at. Um, so far, we have intervened uh, with maybe two or three billion dollars to SEC towards resolution of that. Uh, I think some of the AMCs took us to court, uh, which meant that we couldn't proceed uh, with the depositors. And we, we sat down to determine ourselves that, well, um, even if the owners are taking us to court, uh, we have every reason uh, as a government to look at the depositors and try and put something there in the interim before that is solved. Um, so that was a humanitarian and clear act, and we have, we have done so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we expect by the third or fourth quarter, um, the asset management companies will also be done, and then we'll look at consolidation of all of our debts in one piece. Um, but the, I, I think the objective should be really clear to us. Um, sometimes we forget um, imagine, just, just close your eyes and imagine um, 4.6 million depositors on the roads in our towns like the Great Depression because they have lost their money. It is then that you begin to tease out whether truly, you know, this thing was necessary. Um, where may they have been cost overruns? We don't know, but we think we've done the best um, that the country deserves. And the results are quite clear. You know, when something is working, you kind of take it for granted until it is not there and you see a whole cascading effect of uh, um, men's gold or whatever around the nation and you realize that this was a bold act to be taken of certain consequences, but all in all, you know, the survival of the country uh, and the banking system was saved. And, and I, I think I... I really share in the President's uh, view of congratulating the Bank of Ghana uh, for coming through and us for finding the resources. So even as I talk about $21 billion of shareholder of taxpayers' money, it did still come to the taxpayers in the sense that um, their deposits were saved. 
uh, which might not have been, have been saved. Yeah, well, this will be my last. Uh, Much more. So, should I take it that for the amount of money that was needed to save the banks, you are not in a position to tell us, Bank of Ghana will rather be in a position to tell us the amount of money that could have been used to save the banks? As far as we know, Mr. Chairman, is a $21 billion that we have stated, because that is what uh, we use, and possibly another $8 billion for the AM, for the asset management companies. Thank you. That will be all, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Thank you very much, Chairman. Minister, congratulations. Um, Minister, Ghanaian, the Ghanaian business community is looking up to you and uh, Honorable Chair Martin, the Trade Minister, to put in place deliberate measures and strategies to revive local businesses and to make them very competitive, especially with the coming into force of after, and also with COVID-19 challenges. Um, the service sector is on the decline, the oil and gas sector, contractors have issues with payments, publishers, manufacturers, and the whole um, business community is looking up to you and the trade minister. What deliberate strategies, programs are you going to put in place to give them the confidence that this government under President Kufuado wants to bring them up to that status of being very competitive within a sub-region and globally? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is a uh a whole thesis of um, <laughs> industrial development. You know, but it's an important, a very important question. A uh, center-right party obviously believes uh, in the promotion of business, and I think more than the theory also talks about an entrepreneurial state in which the state becomes a booster um, to support uh, enterprises um, to grow. Um, I, I think you, you can begin to see um, some green shoots of recovery with regards to our approach to MBSSI and, and the, the monies we gave to ensure that um, small and medium enterprises um, begin to get the confidence and have access um, to resources. Um, you know that um, Exim Bank um, has over these four year periods um, uh, been able to uh, fund quite a number of companies, uh, including the Confi, as an example of what uh, can be done. Uh, but we see uh, the huge gap uh, between uh, our savings capacity uh, and financial resources. So the question really for government is either A, whether you can create a domestic environment that is stable, um, and you can see lending rates trending down, not as fast as we'd want. Um, you can see even the COVID period, the foreign exchange was about 3.9% or so, uh, which is very helpful uh, for industry. Of course, demand um, has been torpedoed um, over this period, but it's a good time um, to begin to assess the market and what you did. And we ourselves were impressed with your response um, to the production of PPEs over that time, and we got some resources to support them. Um, the key issue uh, in our mind is whether we can find a vehicle that would bring in other capital. And that is where the intervention um, of uh, the new development bank is concerned so that we can. And that one is supposed to be a billion dollars capitalized. I think we have about 500 million, you know, sewn up already, which uh, we will. So we expect that in May uh, that that will happen. Um, um, in 2020, we did set up a guarantee fund um, of $2 billion. Um, we have given some tax rebates um, for, for this, this, this budget. Uh, truly, our aim is to, is to work um, with them 
um, to, to further um, give them certain stimulus that, that will help them um, to rebuild. So the whole of our Tampa project, really in the end, um, is about um, how to grow businesses for Ghana to become uh, a regional hub in that, which will extend um, their, market, their market share. Um, um, so, Mr. Chairman, um, that is front and center um, to us, uh, and I think we'll continue uh, to have meetings um, with them um, to make sure that that happens. But on the back of that, Mr. Chairman, is um, the President's vision to also turn, you know, literally every resource we have uh, with value add. And, and that is going to be a key way to get more entrepreneurs, you know, graduating uh, from medium level to to um, to the large um, status. Um, and And we tend um, to do that for, for our nation. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, um, my second question is on the revenue side. And um, yesterday we had a very good interaction with your team from the GRE. Um, we know the intentions of government. And we also know the intentions of the citizens. But when it comes to the payment of taxes and other levies becomes an issue, yet we want everything done immediately. Property tax and its collection and other revenue mobilization, mobilizing, mobilization um, strategies, especially property tax. I recall the former senior minister saying that we could raise as much as 10 billion if you're able to put the right strategies in place. People can stand and boast of having 100 houses. But yet, if you ask them how much they pay for property taxes, I think it's sometimes sickening to hear how much they pay. Revenue collection strategies, especially property rates, what can we do to enhance it? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, I think the issue of uh, revenue collection um, certainly has been the bane of the country. We are sort of ranked between 13 and 15 percent of GDP, uh, which is under, you know, maybe what is happening in West Africa, 18 to 20, and the OECD countries almost 32 percent. Um, so when you margin that and GRA is, let's say, uh, about um, 14, 15, and you are moving it to 20, uh, $45 billion, another 15 billion, that would be like 60 billion. You can see uh, the increment. Um, property taxes, as you mentioned, um, senior minister um, did take it on as um, uh, an area in which um, and we're going to do a lot of work. The Vice President Office uh, has also uh, done so. Um, and we need to get this all, in a way, digitalized so that we can have it easily done. And digitalization exercise, as you know, has improved uh, tremendously. And, and right now, we are being able, we are going to transfer the 15.5 million odd um, uh, people um, who have their national IDs uh, onto the GRE list, etc. So we are beginning to now close the circle as to transactions you do and traceability. Um, so you are going to be able to have the data in a way in which you know we know where you live, we know uh, whether you buy a car, we know whether you buy a, uh, an airline ticket, and literally could construct. Uh, your tax returns at the end of April um, for you. I think it's going to lead to a better ability um, to determine uh, where these properties are um, to be able to tax them. Um, so we, we, it's, um, it's key. And, and the, the, the other issue there is property taxes usually are of local government. But if 
uh, we are GRA uh, have the infrastructure, we'll then have to come to some agreement uh, as to how to do it. Uh, the challenge, um, Mr. Chairman, for us then is a look into the management of the districts because you are then going to have an incredible amount of resources going to these districts and therefore the governance structure uh, to ensure um, that, you know, A, they are empowered with skills and B, and the whole issue of managing their hospitals, their schools, etc., draws in the citizenry uh, for empowerment and an ability to ensure that um, um, the, the district assemblies are accountable and that those resources are used very well. I'm not um, completely convinced at this juncture um, that the administrative management of resources are at the, at the level um, that you, um, our guest house, are even comfortable with. Um, so even as we push um, for the realization of property taxation, it's also a looking from the house um, to see what we can do to ensure that these new monies are not going to be wasted and you are going to have strong municipalities who are cleaning their gutters, setting up their security system, you know, in a way in which the citizens can also challenge them and make sure um, that um, all of these areas develop in tandem with the capital cities. Thank you. Chairman, um, to my third question, um, the Bank of Ghana at the recent MPC, Monetary Policy Committee, kept the policy rate at 14.5%. Um, it signals uh, a certain response from the banks and the financial sector as to how credit is online to banks and how it trickles down. Um, banks are complaining about uh, corporate tax, national reconstruction levy, uh, banking sector cleanup, and other related costs. Do we have a strategy in place where they wouldn't, for one of these strategies that the bank, central bank is putting in place, not transfer those costs to SMEs so as to not to affect their businesses and so doing affect customers of the banks and SMEs. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think, Mr. Chairman, the, the issue uh, as we sit um, at the Ministry of Finance looking uh, at the whole of financial landscape um, uh, the Bank of Ghana, um, these um, three, four years, uh, has been pretty uh, decisive, courageous, and promotional. And we can see uh, the forbearances that they gave in 2020 to make sure that the banks do well. I think the banks would also admit that they are a far cry from what they were in 2016 or early 2017, uh, and their numbers do reflect that. Uh, but I think even, even more important um, is their confidence the banking supervision uh, is working much better than it used to work. And, and that, when you are in the industry, is, is huge comfort um, to you. Uh, I think the, the, the numbers of, of um, um, at the stage of, of 2021 with the pandemic of second and third spikes around the world, a lack of security on global, global supply chains, uh, a country that does not have a reserve currency uh, may lead to some sort of caution. Uh, MPCs are not annual uh, and so the ability um, to titrate and therefore decide on whether it should be lower or higher 
uh, is still with us. I don't think we can use, it is not a budget uh, that we can say that uh, nothing uh, can be done. Now, uh, my, my own sense, I mean, I've never owned a bank. We just never had the expertise um, when I was at Data Bank um, to say that because we are a financial institution, we want to own a bank. We just did not have that and stuck to what, 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 what we know how to do. But when you have an association uh, in which um, um, through the period of these uh, very difficult sort of AQRs that were determined and the association does not seem to have teeth uh, as to its self-regulatory um, response uh, to issues. Um, you don't ask whether um, there's collective responsibility. Um, A, to make sure your industry is clean and, and to keep, you know, um, uh, agents um, who will not uh, promote the sanctity of your industry. Um, so, so we all become part of the bad behavior. Uh, and at the very least, uh, we should all be part um, of rebuilding it. Um, and, and so uh, I think an honest discussion uh, will reveal that, you know, really, um, let's, let's, uh, let's bet and share uh, as so that we also share in the profits uh, that are coming. Uh, thank you very much. Everyone, last question. Well, that's my last question. Last question, Mr. Chairman. Very important question. Very, very important. Um, Minister, I've been given the opportunity to ask you this question, um, which worries the private sector. They're asking, they send this question for me to find out from you how you will ensure that banks do not just take deposits and invest in government securities, but rather invest in the private sector. That's my last question. Yeah. From the private sector. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very good question. Um, uh, you would um, realize that we did a guarantee fund. We also have uh, what you could, we call Gessel. Uh, which is supposed to uh, support um, agric um, uh, industry areas. Um, I think even in countries as the United States, um, there are rules uh, which ensure um, that community development are part of uh, the, the, the remit of the banks. Uh, and so I, I think we, uh, we, we may need to have a, a dialogue you know, as we develop the Oba Tampa program, which is going to have discussions uh, with banks, financial institutions, pension funds, as to their participation in this transformation exercise. Uh, and in that, I'm sure we can construct uh, some agreements on um, how to um, ensure uh, maybe some participation of some law. But, but these are things uh, that will particularly be led um, by the BOG. Uh, it is when the government decides um, to either um, guarantee certain things to facilitate it. Um, but I think the BAG is also anxious for growth uh, within this stuff. And, and, and we hope that we will be able to other banks get profitable, um, have these discussions, um, which will move us um, together um, in this transformation exercise. And thank you, sir. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My first question to the honorable nominee relates to the annual report on the management and use of petroleum revenues. And in particular, the reports of PIAC, the Public Interest and Accountability Committee. And I believe it's in order, Mr. Chairman, with your permission to 
uh, congratulate PIAC on their 10th anniversary with the they celebrated yesterday. I noticed the president was with them yesterday. But let me begin with the 2019 report. At page 15 of the report, PIAC writes, and this is the report submitted to parliament in compliance with the law. PIAC states, and I quote, for the third consecutive year, the actual ABFA was not fully utilized or accounted for. It brings the total unutilized and unaccounted for ABFA to one billion four hundred and seventy nine million eight hundred ninety six thousand two hundred ninety nine point eight six Ghana cities at end of twenty nineteen. It continues. The Ministry of Finance is acting with impunity regarding accounting for the use of ADFA. PIAC therefore urges Parliament to bring its oversight mandate to bear. Unquote. I also hold in my hands an August 2020 issue paper that PIAC was forced to publish because of the continuous non-compliance. And at page 24 of the report, the, of the issue paper, PIAC had this to say, the recurring non-compliance in the reported expenditure of the Ministry of Finance to the PRMA requirement to spend at least 70% of the ADFA on public investment expenditure is another challenge. In 2019, 55% was spent on capital expenditure and 45% spent on goods and services. Another challenge in the implementation of the law relates to the recurrence of unutilized ADFA as at the end of 2019, the total unspent ABF amounted to 1.48 billion Ghana cities. This situation is worrying, especially as it is becoming a trend and corruption risk to the management and use of petroleum revenues. Honorable nominee, this has continued and according to PIAC in the 2020 report to parliament, they are putting the final figure of unaccounted for oil revenues at 2.46 billion as at end of June 2020. I am aware of meetings that have taken place between you and uh, PIAC, and I know that PIAC stands by this figure of 2.46 billion Ghana cities unaccounted for petroleum revenues. How do you respond to this, honorable nominee? And how can you assure this committee that if given the nod, what PIAC is calling a culture of impunity under your watch will stop? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you mentioned, we have had a series of meetings of PIAC um, to try and reconcile um, these numbers and their use. Uh, I can assure um, the House uh, that this is not um, tantamount um, to any, any type of corruption um, uh, from the ministry or the government um, in, in any way. Um, so um, we, we should we should be be clear on that. Um, with regard to therefore the number of 2.4 billion uh, in which they insist uh, insist um, on, um, you can see that president was at the, at the ceremony um, um, yesterday, um, and that is an indication. 
of our commitment um, to work with them um, to, to, clear, to clear that. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, let me assure you that um, all of these um, issues um, would be um, resolved um, and uh, we can have you know, a happy medium uh, with PIAC um, going forward. We, we do, we, um, we, we, we do not, I mean, there, there may be honest uh, mistakes made, uh, but there's no um, profligacy uh, on our part or uh, a sense of arrogance as to uh, the use uh, of public money. Um, I mean, my training uh, as an investor uh, was to invest people's money, and that has to be protected. And so when you look at um, data bank, it's investment of 500,000 people's money, and, and those are uh, sacrosanct. Um, so, um, Mr. Chairman, let, let me assure you that uh, all of these things will be resolved, and, and we're we'll going to have um, a period um, these four years coming uh, in which we are all um, totally uh, aligned. And that's my commitment um, to you. Mr. Chairman, by way of follow-up, is the Honorable Nominee able to give us an indication on when this will be resolved? You've given us an assurance that you will resolve this. Well, we with have had um, the 10th year anniversary. Uh, I am back um, uh, full-time at work. Um, we should, um, after the Easter break, uh, have a meeting with the new, with the new chair uh, and craft uh, a way forward. Um, that will be comfortable um, for, for everyone and for the tenets um, of the law. Uh, that assurance uh, I give you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I move to my second question, uh, which relates to, uh, I would say, genuine growing concern about what some analysts are calling a stranglehold over the financial sector uh, by your close business associates and, and allies. Um, some have even suggested that it's classic uh, state capture and that um, if this is not really looked at, it would be inimical to Ghana's uh, financial progress and so far as uh, best practice and transparency is, is concerned. Um, I have the incorporation documents of uh, the entities you have interest in, uh, Data Bank Financial Services, Data Bank Asset Management, Data Bank Brokerage Limited, enterprise group of companies. And I see that the directors and, sh and, and key shareholders are the persons that you have placed in very strategic positions. For example, you have Kelly Gajapo, who sits on the Bank of Ghana board. You have Reverend Obami Tete, who is uh, Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission. You know they regulate the investment companies. You have Samson Kligo, who is director of financial sector at the Ministry of Finance, and is also sitting on the board of the National Insurance Commission. So if you take the banking sector, you take the investment sector, you take the insurance sector, your close associates and, and, and director shareholders of your companies are in charge of the sector. How do you respond to genuine concern that there is some stranglehold, some state capture that uh, uh, is, is going on, and for that matter, we are not having a fair ecosystem for other businesses uh, to thrive? And how do you even think that these regulators can regulate entities that you have uh, beneficial interest in? Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, the, the issue of, um, I mean, state capture of a financial sector, um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a difficult one to behold. I mean, the, first of all, um, the Minister of Finance certainly uh, has some sway uh, with regards to um, whoever they appoint um, to be um, board members. And it could be Kojo Kwame or it could be Kali. Uh, you would have put a person there. Um, so is the state capture hidden because of the name or not? Um, it's an issue. Um, issue of competence, um, I think it's important here. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you look um, outside uh, of the state, um, you'll see that because of the 30 years uh, in which the firm um, has run uh, on values and skills, um, our alumni are everywhere uh, in, in the banking and financial institution um, of, of deep influence uh, in what they do. Um, should companies like ours um, create sub -bar, sub -bar personnel, um, we shouldn't. And, and if they have um, the technical requirements, should we or should we not lose them? I think it comes down to, to really um, whether we continue um, with a sense um, of cynicism and, um, you know, uh, a minister um, trying to uh, enrich uh, himself. Um, I, I suspect you know um, that um, the issue of public service uh, is one that really uh, has been with the family for a long time. And uh, I came into it with that, with that aspect, with that um, I do not um, take a salary, I do not take a per diem, I, you know. So th th those, those are not the objectives um, that I come with. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was so easy um, to get banking license over these 30 years if one chose to. But our expertise was in investment, and we are not going to drift um, because there were opportunities uh, to do that. Do we have problems um, in these areas? We did, and um, therefore, uh, would you have um, people uh, that you trust, uh, that are professional, uh, to participate in those sectors? Yes, you will. Um, so Kelly may be one of the directors at the central bank. Um, that is uh, out of maybe, what, nine or something, um, in terms of um, coming into a new organization uh, with people that you feel have the capacity to help. Yeah, I think we have 10 directors at the ministry, of which we promoted to, to be coordinating directors, and Samson is one uh, of the 10 directors. Um, I think you also realize that in the past um, maybe um, years, quite a number of years um, uh, before uh, we came into government, uh, the Ministry of Finance lacked people with investment expertise. Uh, and so there was nothing happening promotionally uh, in, that, in that area. Um, and I think we should celebrate the entry uh, of, of an investment expert uh, into, into that ministry. So you, you, could, you could look at it, you know, half empty or half full. Uh, you could be cynical about a motive um, to state capture um, an industry. Uh, you could also look at the results um, of growth uh, in, in the industry and say that something positive um, is happening. Um, accusations, therefore, of trying to stymie um, other competitors has never been our view. We have grown from a cantama to enterprise 30 years ago uh, into a high street enterprise. We know how to grow. Uh, in small doses, and, and we have done that. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me assure you um, that um, that cannot be the motive. Uh, if people are using um, the aftermath of the banking crisis as a way of um, uh, finding um, data point um, to illuminate this, uh, I think the results 
of where we are with the banking crisis is clear. Uh, I think data banks' um, um, reputation as an investment house and not a banking institution um, is also very clear. Uh, and I think we also came um, to really do public service. And, and so far, that is what we have continued to do. Um, so yes, they may declare that uh, by honorable members, um, um, I'll give you the assurance that uh, we came into public service to serve. Uh, we came to bring the best skill set and to advance our promotion uh, as a country and um, what the values that we brought with us uh, will really not uh, encourage us to, um, to uh, assume such um, dastardly uh, objectives for the nation. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, related to that is um, some key indicators people look at. Uh, for example, I hold in my hands the Damsel Report, which is uh, published by your own data bank. And you take um, uh, one instrument like uh, the M Fund, which was launched in 2004. Uh, the total assets under management from 2004 to 2017 was just a little above 313 million. But between 2017 and 2020, when you became finance minister, it shot up from 313 to 808 million. Report. Over 500 million cities, almost 500 million cities uh, in actual increment. That's some hopping 258%. And if you look at the previous years, the 13 or 14 years prior to 2017, since the M Fund was launched, it has never done this well. So people are looking at these numbers. You take enterprise insurance, for example. When the ambulances that we purchased was to be insured, it was enterprise that was selected. Uh, frontline healthcare workers, the insurance of our uh, heroes in this COVID-19 fight is enterprise insurance, uh, which uh, uh, your dear, dear wife, our Rock of Ages, who we are all very proud of, is director of. So these are, these are real numbers, real facts. Meanwhile, other businesses are collapsing and uh, uh, others are, are, are closing shop. So people are pointing to these real indicators. How do you respond to that? M Fund and Enterprise uh, being given all of these big insurance deals under you as finance minister. Yeah. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for this question. Um, I, I think we should um, we should really, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, examine um, these issues properly. Um, if you look in the landscape um, for uh, asset uh, management, uh, we are talking, uh, Mr. Chairman, about a 30-year company of incredible uh, human resources that literally developed the asset management business you would wonder whether that company was also victimized. Honorable Minister, we can't hear you from here. You Can would wonder victimized? also whether uh, the, that company uh, was also victimized in times when uh, the political season uh, was different. Uh, but, but I think that the key issue uh, becomes one of competence uh, and fair judgment and when um, you come in to bid for certain things. Now the question about moving from um, 330 to 800 and something, uh, as you, you mentioned, um, the question is, you know, uh, how much in resources and new monies uh, were uh, in the marketplace and therefore what was the proportion of that to that? Um, should a company like that grow? Uh, of course it should grow. 
we talk about enterprise insurance, you talk about what a company that is um, what, been here since 1924, um, which has um, built up uh, a life business uh, that is par none and a general business uh, that is par none. Um, I think the, the, the challenge of, um, of companies that have durability and invest uh, in their companies to build their balance sheets and train people uh, as opposed to new companies um, that um, uh, are just registered as happening in the banking institutions uh, leading to the collapse uh, should, should be rarely examined. Um, I think it's, it's easy, rarely, um, to just throw stones at it and say that it is because one is a finance minister. Uh, but, but as I assured you, I don't get involved uh, in any of these things. I've not been a director since whatever. And maybe there's just uh, more boldness uh, in, in coming into bed uh, for things uh, and in people assessing the capacity uh, of these companies. Um, really, uh, I have told um, the NIC and these regulators that they, sh they ought to be publishing uh, productivity, assets under management, etc. And maybe we as a government uh, should be drawing a line that if you are below a certain amount um, uh, capacity, uh, you can manage our resources. Uh, there has to be a way in which we credit assess uh, as opposed to say, I also have a company and I couldn't do it. And I think that should be revelatory and transparent and we should be looking to build uh, first class companies but not ascribe it uh, to the fact that uh, somebody is a finance minister, etc. And that's why that is what is happening. Um, so I will warrant uh, a challenge uh, for us to begin um, to look at the capacities of all of these companies before um, such easy talk is allowed, uh, which is also quite demoralizing um, to a building and investing uh, in your people if you want to create first class companies. Uh, but assurance that no, I do not get involved in these things. Uh, this work is for public service. Uh, to enhance where the Republic um, is going. Uh, and we, if you have been able to build strong companies um, over a certain period, even over 30 years, um, surely um, there are times and opportunities uh, in which that will show and illustrate that. Mr. Chairman, finally from me will be a COVID question. And I make reference to Appendix 12A of the 2021 Budget and Financial Policy Document. If you look at the status of COVID-19 alleviation program, CAP-1, the entries in there, Some of the numbers are very worrying. For example, if you take item number five, transfer of Government of Ghana COVID account for Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration for airfares for 2,221 returnees from Lebanon. Mr. Chairman, could I excuse myself for a second? Very oh, well.
Dr. Noguchi Hideo devoted himself to research of yellow fever, of which he eventually died in Ghana. Carrying on the spirit of Dr. Noguchi, the Noguchi Medical Research Institute was constructed as a center of infectious disease research and countermeasures in 1979 with the assistance of the Japanese government. Since then, Japan has improved the institute's facilities, provided essential equipment, and built up research and testing capabilities over many years. Through our 40 years of cooperation, the institute has grown immensely. Our current cooperation has shifted to train young researchers by conducting joint research. So far, at least 50 Ghanaian researchers participated in training programs in Japan. These programs offer them the opportunity to observe Japan's new research techniques and experimental methods. Lebanon. 46 million 398,352 Ghana cities. That uh, works out to some 20,890 Ghana cities as the cost of one air ticket. Even today, as the aviation industry is recovering, you can get a, a ticket and that, uh, even that's a two-way ticket for $511. This is, this is more than $4,000 looking at the exchange rate at the time. It doesn't appear to me that the public purse is being protected by some of these expenditures. You take item four, transfer of 19.3 million cities. The ministry is, is saying that they are not uh, aware of this account. So the question is, will you support a special audit into the entire COVID-19 expenditure? Because some of these figures really, um, uh, there are lots of questions. Mr. Chairman, I, I think it's, um, it's really a, a very um, simple issue. Um, I, w I will go back um, um, to confirm um, these and bring at least uh, an initial report on these transactions or MFARA, and then we will we will take it uh, from there. Uh, I, I know certain uh, payments uh, were made uh, with regards to um, the gathering of these people in Lebanon, etc. Uh, but those are administrative issues that. I'm sure um, we, we can sort out so that it's not necessarily linked to, to the ticket uh, per se. Um, uh, so they'll give me the opportunity um, to, to relook really at that. Um, I, I think really um, the, the, the issue um, of, of COVID-19 um, 2020 was a devastating one. I mean, the pressures uh, to bring our people home uh, the conditions they were in. Um, I mean, I'm sure um, various ministries had to do some things uh, in haste to avoid um, the suffering of, of Ghanaians and wherever they may be. And, and we'll, we'll get to, to the bottom of this um, for, for you. Thank you, sir. Very well. Um, uh, 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 Yes, Robert Gisela, I, I promised you that I'll give you the chance so you can go back to your committee. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Honorable Nominee. Thank you very much. Happy to see that you are fully recovered. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. You have the strength for the job for the next four years. Amen. It looks good, don't you think so? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask you something on the construction industry. Your ministry is a heartbeat of any government. Construction is also the heartbeat, one of the heartbeats, main heartbeats of the economy. If you get approved by this house, if you get approved by this house in your second term, are you going to reconsider the issue 
of contractors' payments vis-à-vis -vis the basic project management principles of trying to adhere to time and budget on projects because there are a lot of cost project overruns, cost overruns in the whole project management space. And a lot of it is because payments are not made on time and so it's hard for contractors to keep to their work schedules and then they have to go back to ministries to ask for rates reviews and so on and so forth. And ultimately, government is a loser. But all these decisions are being taken by people. So, as a custodian of the public purse, what will you do differently in your second term to make sure that this situation is changed for the better for the country? And also to realize that contractors have invested time and effort and money in their equipment. Their businesses are often run down when the political season, as my senior colleague here just mentioned the word, as the political season changes. Is there going to come a time in this country when that will change? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And, and, and this, this is really uh, a very significant um, question uh, in our attempt um, to um, to develop um, this, this nation, um, because it's um, it's really very easy to place um, the blame on on one side of the coin um, as to government, um, uh, and but, but but there there's enough blame on both sides um, of of government and and contractors um, because of. Um, I guess that's the nature of the way we, we have developed. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, we have a, a commitment um, a sort of control and policy uh, that we are bringing um, to, to cabinet for approval, uh, which essentially says that if you are given a budget, you have to stick within the budget. To be able to change it in any way it has to come all the way through cabinet, and you are uh, to identify resources within your budget um, to do that. Um, you would realize that, um, especially since we came, we have devolved um, all power to the ministries with regards to uh, whom they select, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and um, invariably, uh, you see add-ons um, to projects uh, which are not there, and therefore keeps the cycle of areas going, and that must stop. And of course, that in a sense is initiated by contractors uh, in a way. Uh, so we need to find a way to sign me that, that if this is what we are doing for this year, this is what we are doing for this year, and no more add-ons. And I think you'll be able to clear the areas uh, as we go on and not have projects that should not be in there doing it. Uh, I think we also have um, some issues of, of value for money, uh, in which um, uh, sometimes when you put consultants on um, to determine um, what it is that needs to be done, uh, you, have, you have certain roads uh, overlapping certain roads and being charged, you know, uh, as an ascension uh, of that and therefore various projects on the same uh, five uh, mile stretch uh, that has different uh, fixed costs and vehicles are located to them. All of these add up um, to cost uh, that we should be uh, able um, to, to, to stop. Um, so, so I think that there's a need um, for quite a big overhaul in the way in which um, the contractors uh, and the ministry uh, operate. Um, I know last year we, we set up um, uh, a value for money overview team um, that has um, suggested uh, various ways to, to tackle that. Uh, but I think we should, we should because uh, Ghana um, is alleged to be uh, one of sort of the highest um, costs um, for roads and stuff. Um, so, so we should uh, be working um, to clear that um, so that uh, we can have uh, certain um, costs that, that are sustainable, uh, projects that should not be funded, uh, should not come uh, into, into 
uh, the, the, the funding time, uh, and then payments will be on time and budgets uh, will, be, will also be on time. We have also, as you know, uh, um, 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 agreed on uh, what we call continuity and completion um, so that at least um, all projects, irrespective of which government, uh, will be looked at um, for completion as, as we move forward. Um, so I think that there's going to be a big effort uh, these four years uh, to streamline um, how projects are approved and be to also continue to complete uh, projects that, that exist um, so that there will be a little bit more robustness um, in, in the construction industry. Um, the issue of PPPs are also going to be um, um, uh, promoted and uh, we now have um, uh, are having discussions and MOUs, um, Uganda Investment and Infrastructure Fund, as to how to look at uh, major projects so that it's not necessarily uh, on government budget books, uh, but on an investment scheme, uh, which then returns rewards uh, for, for GIF. Thank you. You had a scheme I think it was a policy that you developed at the ministry whereby contractors were asked to present their certificates and the certificates were discounted by, was it 10 to 15 percent? I'm not sure of the percentage. How, how efficient and how effective was that policy, if you can tell us? Thank you very much. I, I, um I mean, my, my sense was that it, it, um, it did well. Um, but Mr. Chairman, th this is um, really not um, sort of a, a new thing uh, with regards to uh, contractors discounting um, their certificates to be able to, it's an old instrument um, that is done. Uh, it created a bit of uproar and then um, contractors um, um, came to the realization that it was to their benefit, uh, and I think it worked very well and reduced uh, the amount of areas uh, in there. Um, so I, I think it, it helped uh, with the issue of, of reducing the stress uh, in the industry and, and put some liquidity uh, in the market for it. All right. Well, I think that um, it was more a case of some contractors just being desperate for cash, and so having to wipe off their pro their profits that they have made over the years as they were just waiting to have their tickets cleared. So I think that some of these policies, even if it was an old one, as you come in, you try to make improvements on the system. So I'm hoping that that will also be done so that it can be a, a more effective way, perhaps, of releasing some cash, as you said, onto the market. But effectively, as you know, a lot of contractors do not have the, the luxury of interest or delayed payments on GOG projects and so on and so forth. So it really hits them hard. And I hope that... I'm disabled. Good. Yes, I was there. Can you pursue the question? I'll Thank you very much. can advise him later when we are done with him. <laughs> Mr. Exactly. Thank you very much. But I'm just trying to advocate for the construction industry because it's only fair and right to do so. Madam, please, hold your peace. Thank you. Mr. Honorable Nomni, I see you, you're almost always in white. What's the secret behind it? Actually, it's uh, Echoes Jazz 699, uh, which says that, you know, I guess be grateful for where you are, uh, anoint your hair. And I think it says, love your wife or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so on that quiet note, Mr. Honorable Nomini, I would wish that, and I'll, I'll pray, that with that same heart, Yes. of whiteness. Yes. You remember those people who have, who invested their monies in all these financial institutions that were collapsed. Amen. And you remember that they also could need some relief. Amen. 
because they've been sitting there just waiting patiently for their money and people have lost their loved ones. Some have had illnesses and so on and so forth. Yes. Thank you very much. So Thank have you. a heart for them Thank and you. do the needful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll give you one lady. I'll go to a gentleman before I come back, a lady. Uh, Uh, well, uh, um, yes, uh, Hassan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Honorable Ken Foriata, I congratulate you, and I wish you well. I have had uh, opportunity to work very closely with you, especially in relation to um, dumping in the petroleum sector, and the tremendous support that I received from you has to be put on record. Uh, you are a very strong pillar of support in the fight against, you know, illicit trading in the petroleum sector. Um, f first question I have, first question I have um, is, you know, in relation to standing orders of this house, and I know you don't have any powers to, to change it. But it has to do with the mode of reading the annual budget. I have a feeling sometimes that it's like it's an exercise in determining who has more stamina than the other. <laughs> From Kosibo Trace time, Professor Kosibo Trace time, you come and sit there and then stand on your feet, read budget for first, too long, three, minimum three hours. I don't think that's, you know, the way to go. Can't we have a much redacted version? Lay it, and then you go. <laughs> what do you think about this? This, I mean, we've been doing it, so we think maybe that is the right thing. But I, you go uh, across other jurisdictions. Uh, you, as you said, that is parliament arrangement in accordance yes, but with. But I just want his opinion on it. Yes. Uh, all right. Mr. Chairman, um, our GDP, um, it's uh, our 400 billion, and we expect this thing uh, to grow as we grow into uh, a middle income rich country, um, God willing, in the near term. Uh, we, we're going to have a huge budget that is going to be impossible to. Uh, but I suspect um, Parliament um, would adjust itself to make sure it gets um, the Minister uh, in Parliament for the appropriate time and still have uh, the time to, to debate that. Um, because certainly uh, the budget is not read in the United States Congress. <laughs> it's just too huge for OMB, OMB to do that. Um, so I, I'll leave it to you as we grow and you adjust your standing orders accordingly. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, in 2020, uh, the government paid in excess of about $1 billion to the IPPs. Similarly, ECG also made payments also around 2.7 billion Ghana cities to the same IPPs. And there's been some negotiations for these um, IPPs regarding, you know, possibility of making some more savings from um, the, the uh, excess capacity. Can you update the committee on where we stand with some of these negotiations and whether there is a possibility that we can make um, further gains regarding excess capacity charges? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think we have been in the past 18 months um, having negotiations with Senate, Sem Power, um, Early Power, uh, Mandi, um, AXA, um, Car Power, and I think Nasogli. Um, uh, we have gone um, some ways with Senate. Um, I think um, there was some stalling. Um, during uh, 2020 as the OPEC DFC 
uh, invested companies um, and, the, and the Japanese are uh, same power, uh, early power, and Mandy um, sort of waited. Um, this has now um, gotten into high gear um, as to um, um, the discussions um, on time sheets um, that we are doing. Uh, we also have had extensive discussions of AXA and giving them a term sheet that they have come back um, to us with. Um, I think we've gotten to uh, literally a break-even point where uh, my uh, feeling is that by September uh, we should have been able um, to renegotiate um, uh, these to save the country uh, considerable uh, resources. Um, so we, we are moving uh, in the right direction, and uh, we expect to, to, to make um, uh, quite huge savings uh, in, that, in that score. As you know, we also introduced um, uh, some taxes um, this year um, to see whether we can close the gap between what the ECG uh, pays and the tariffs um, that, that they get. Um, so that's the, uh, the, the two-run approach that we have taken um, to, to sort out um, the, the, ta um, the imbalances we have in the system. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So the, the dilemma of a Minister of Finance is that your colleagues are pulling you from different angles, the colleague ministers and other agencies. Everybody needs m money. Now, where to get the funds, you have to go and borrow or you, you levy taxes. Either of the two people are attacking you from left, right, center. How do you manage to survive all of this? How do you, I don't have, because my meetings with you are mostly after midnight. I wonder how you rest. I mean, how do you do all of these things? The balance. The balance. Thank you very much for, um, for the sympathies here. Um, but I remember uh, Madame Lagarde saying, in effect, that if a finance minister is loved, then he's not doing his job. <laughs> so <laughs> that goes uh, with the territory. But, but, but I think truly um, the, 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 the excitement um, and really a blessing of, of being a finance minister is, is, is the overview um, that uh, you get uh, and uh, the, the sense of apportionment as you see uh, your president's vision uh, and see how you get there and, and to shield uh, the vision uh, from the individual needs of your colleague ministers and somehow apportion it. But to also think deeply and challenge the status quo um, really, um, as to how best um, to use um, these limited resources um, to go uh, very far. Uh, at the same time, you, 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 you know uh, everybody is a citizen and therefore has the right um, to be able um, to have social mobility uh, as you have. And, and that, that, that is a challenge. Um, so the issue of, let's say, senior high school education uh, is a matter of choice. Um, what kind of percentage of GDP do you give uh, to ensure that um, uh, the average person like you uh, can also become like you uh, because the state um, has given that opportunity? And so I think it's that adrenaline uh, and passion uh, that keeps one going and to understand that um, uh, you've been given um, uh, a mission or a role uh, to play uh, that is important for the growth of the Republic. Um, so thanks for recognizing the difficulties, um, but um, um, we shall continue to, to persevere. Yes, I'm very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.
Wie gesagt, ja, Mann. Das ist okay. Ist es noch okay? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. My first question has to do with the report of the Auditor General for the year 2019. As you are all aware, democracy detects that power must be exercised in consonance with the law. Unfortunately, the Auditor General's report indicates that in 2018, the Ministry of Finance acted not in consonance with the laws of our land. And that occasion some kind of misappropriation amounting to 193 million Ghana cities. The speaker, with your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, I'd like to refer to the report. Paragraph 139 of the 2019 Auditor General's report states that Section 69 of the Revenue Administration Act, 2016 Act 915 states that the minister shall set aside an amount of not more than 6% of the total revenue collected under this act and any other enactment administered by the Commissioner General in an account designated as the Ghana Revenue Authority General Refund Account, from which refunds due under this act and refunds due under any other tax law shall be paid by the Commissioner General. Contrary to the above provision, a total amount of 193 million 277,758.03 Ghana cities was used in settling payments other than for tax refunds. Then a table is provided. Some companies have been mentioned for the year 2018. Some, all these payments were made. It's a long table. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, the most Interesting part is that paragraph 142 states, management in response stated that it acted on directives from the finance ministry to effect the payments from the refund account. So the Ministry of Finance directed the management of the fund to set aside, to suppress the laws and then pay, use the monies in that fund to make payments outside the law. What is the minister's take on this? And why did the minister or the ministry decide to engage in such an illegality, knowing very well that our actions must be detected by the laws of the land? Wow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I think the, I mean, um, I'm sure um, the House has had reason to um, contest some of the statements of the Auditor General. I mean, my understanding really of the law uh, in terms of 6% um, for tax refunds uh, is really inclusive um, of the fact that uh, this is part of revenue mobilization costs uh, and not necessarily operational costs. Um, so uh, I guess in my interpretation, and I guess that's subject to debate, uh, was that actions that we took 
that led to revenue mobilization qualify under this? And I think that's something that uh, we can all debate and decide on. I mean, you do get refunds, uh, and so when we also uh, mobilize the resources to be able uh, to pay you. Uh, and so that, that, that in my mind, uh, was a categorization that justified that um, was certainly not an illegality. Mm. Mr. Chairman, my second question. In October 2020, the Honorable Minister, the Honorable Nominee, participated in the virtual plenary session of the Development Committee of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. As part of your contributions to the discussions, you called for debt forgiveness, a cancellation for vulnerable and debt distressed countries in the world, including Ghana. You also seized the opportunity of that occasion to call for the extension of the debt service suspension initiative introduced by the G20 for vulnerable countries, including Ghana. You are aware that the public debt stock stood at 122 billion Ghana cities when you assumed office in January 2017. Today, the debt stock has ballooned to 291 billion Ghana cities. And when you look at the 2021 budget, the projections that you have placed before this house, in 2021, you project to raise a total revenue plus grants of 72 billion Ghana cities. And you project to pay interest on debt amounting to 35 billion Ghana cities, amortization of 15 billion Ghana cities. If you put amortization and interest on debt together, that will give you 50 billion Ghana cities, plus compensation of 30 billion will be 80 billion Ghana cities. Meaning that even if you are able to raise all the revenues that you have projected and receive all the grants projected, that will not be able to pay for interest, amortization, and compensation, leaving a huge gap for you to borrow to fail. So it means that this year, we are to borrow to be able to pay compensations, goods and services, and even statutory payments. These are symptoms of an ailing economy, an economy that is indeed in the doldrums and gasping for breath. You want us to give you the opportunity to serve for another term. What new strategies do you propose to reverse the situation and to restore hope among Ghanaians? Thank you very much indeed um, for this um, question, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have indeed um, moved from 122 billion um, to 292 uh, billion, um, which is about 76 percent of, of GDP, um, as as we look at it. Um, I think we identified right from the beginning in 2017 uh, the five buckets of revenue expenditure. Um, statutory payments, uh, interest, um, and compensation um, as weaknesses in which we needed 
uh, fiscal space. Uh, we have, as you know, uh, over this period, uh, fiscal impact of COVID um, of maybe 19 to 20 billion, uh, financial sector cleanup um, of 21 billion, excess capacity charges uh, paid also inherited of 12 billion, uh, the impact of reduction in growth from average of 7% um, to 0.9%. Uh, changes in forex, um, et cetera. Um, so we have a number of um, ways um, that, of course, this, this can be uh, approached, as you mentioned. Uh, we did uh, ask for um, debt forgiveness on that side. Um, we have, um, I think, been successful with the U.S. approving um, some 500 um, billion um, SDRs uh, which will go at much lower interest rates uh, for countries um, such as ours. Uh, that will be helpful. Um, as you know, uh, we have begun to examine issues um, as to what we do about gold and um, cocoa, uh, which will lead to equity um, in the system, and that uh, has to be looked at. Uh, but if you look at the uh, Obatampa program, and what we expect to do with regards to an increase of 30 billion over the next three years uh, from GRA and a 7 billion infusion from outside. Uh, those are all productivity elements that would increase our exports uh, and therefore trade numbers um, so that uh, we can be more productive and export driven, um, adding value um, to our resources. Uh, Akufuado's vision of therefore value, adding value to all um, of our natural resources um, is the way um, to go um, uh, to do that. Um, so clearly um, we have um, um, foreseen this uh, and, and we are doing what we can to do that. I mean, I think there's one um, other area of importance um, that, that we should think about, which really is the digitalization of, of our economy. Uh, in that is where all these leakages uh, that we have uh, will be stopped. Uh, we literally should be able to double our GRA um, proceeds, uh, which should bring uh, another 45 odd billion um, to be able to address those issues. I think we are going a long way with digitalization. We are committed. Um, to finding the resources um, to do that, and that would ensure that we all participate um, in this. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, we've gone through um, uh, a period of four years in which, in a sense, uh, we stabilized the economy until the COVID in, 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 uh, disruption. Um, we will get back to normalcy uh, as we target debt sustainability um, back to uh, deficit that is within 5% uh, ensure that the Obatampa uh, project um, is on course. Um, look ways in which we add value um, to our exports before we go so that we transform the economy and not get back uh, into uh, issues of increasing debt. Um, but, but I guess um, uh, as you look also um, at the new normal, uh, most economies um, have had to um, um, ratchet up debt. I think Africa's debt has moved from 34 to 56% or so uh, in, in short order. Uh, and uh, most uh, G20 countries uh, are spending over 20% of GDP um, to make sure that they put the, the, that type of resources in that. Uh, so the world is adjusting uh, to this new normal um, of debt sustainability, and, and we, are, we are part of it. But we, at the very least, have put in a program to see how uh, we get out of, of that dragnet. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm indulging, Chairman, indulge me. Minister, in your answer, you are certain that public debt is 291 billion, 92 billion. Now, are you rounding up? Because as I look at paragraph 149, page 36 of the budget, 
I see 291 billion 614. Is it that since 12 March we've added on, or you have done quick and easy <laughs> mathematics of a runoff to 292 billion? I just want it Mr. for Chairman, a record. It's 291.6 billion, 76.1%. Uh, Round it up in your words to 292 billion. That, that's right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Another dimension to our national debt discussion, which portrays a very gloomy picture for the upcoming generation, has to do with the collateralized borrowings. Honorable Minister, I will recall that after the conclusion of the Article 4 consultation of the IMF with Ghana, the IMF cautions the Ghanaian government against collateralized borrowing. And the government decided not to heed that genuine advice. And now to speak, the Ghana Get Fund receivables have been monetized for $1.5 billion from the Chinese government, payable within the next 10 years. We have also monetized receivables from the energy sector levies for 15 years. Cocoa has been collateralized for $600 million, payable within seven years. I've also collateralized bauxite deposits in the Tiwa Forest area for two billion dollars for a two billion dollar from the Chinese under the Sino Hydro deal. And now the president hints of a Japa in the pipeline, which will also take care of the royalties that we receive from gold. Honorable nominee, all these collateralized borrowings are not calculated as part of our debt stock. But you know, it comes as a huge liability for the future. Have you not, by this collateralization, impose huge liabilities on the upcoming generation because future revenues that will service future conditions have been monetized for present expenditure. Have you not imposed huge liabilities on our children? Thank you very much um, uh, for that question. And, and I think um, we um, need to, um, I guess, uh, debate the issues of, um, of how uh, a country um, develops and use um, its resources uh, ring-fenced um, to ensure um, that those areas um, give us um, uh, the best return um, for, for our monies. Um, uh, when we look at um, Get Fund, for example, and we look at the human capacity, uh, we talk about um, SHS. Um, I think in my view, I, I don't even believe that um, um, the whole issue of human capital should be addressed as um, goods and services. Uh, it's essential that we look at it um, as a capital cost that's important um, for, for the future. Um, and then you begin to look at um, interventions um, in our economy that are important for us to grow. Um, so you talk about energy, and um, you have to declare on how um, you reduce costs so that industrialization 
uh, or care. Uh, you look at cocoa, uh, you begin to find ways uh, in which you can capitalize on today um, so that, as I mentioned, you are part of the 140 billion stream as opposed to the 3 billion stream. Uh, you have your bauxite um, locked up um, for good. And then how do you bring it uh, to shore or turn it into alumina or aluminum over a certain period? Um, so the question is whether we as Ghanaians trust that we'll be able to turn these resources by, to add value um, to these areas um, so that we gain the benefit of that. And, and that is the discussion, uh, not one of just uh, putting debt uh, for the future without productivity return on that. And I think all of these things uh, can yield, um, get fund to make sure that our human capital is more productive than before, as well as to make sure that uh, we have energy um, that supports industrial growth, um, cocoa and bauxite, uh, to make sure we add value to it uh, and get into the supply chain uh, at values that are good uh, for us. Um, so it's after 60 years uh, of nation building, um, I think we need to rethink that. And I think this eighth meeting of parliament uh, offers us an opportunity uh, as a nation of a balanced parliament uh, to begin to really ask the, the question uh, as to how best do we find the resources to transfer our economy and what should we put in place as we get uh, into these uh, collateralized um, transactions and uh, equity related transactions such as HFR. And I think it's up to us really uh, to begin to speak a common language of understanding of where we want to go as a nation and not um, debate um, every issue that truly uh, will lead to a transformation of our, of our economy. Um, I, I think, I mean, if you look at the cocoa industry, for example, uh, I mean, it's a real injustice that uh, the average farmer, 650,000 families, um, sweat, cut their legs, are bitten by snakes, and then we give them 70% of the producer price. While well, there's a whole derivative market um, and value add of 140 billion, and we sit and benefit uh, from the two, three billion they bring, and we have not been able to find a solution and uh, to participate in that part of the industry so that we actually may even be able to pay them double what they end um, for, um, for the seed. Um, and, and so th those are the real questions we should ask ourselves. Are we doing our people justice by just sitting on the old way in which we do things. And if we bring such things to the table, how do we, uh, as a nation, speak the same language uh, to make sure um, that uh, we get the best results from it? Because other countries are doing that. And why can't we do that? Thank you. OK, gentlemen, my last question. In the 2019 State of the Nation Address, His Excellency the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Adodankwa Akufado, indicated that his government has procured The way Zonami Mapon Polo playing a cellar of our Najifia year. A blaming year, me won a chan, a benya yauda, Mina, Miawe, one new one a year. Kelefia, I knew Kau Lebenya, Paklo Miawo. A bed be Vienne, a bed to come a Vienne, a bed Gana Viva Vane, bed to come and I knew. Fian 